does work, yeah. Uh, right. Shall we get started? Uh, first of all, it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce uh, Jorg Stolman. Uh, Jorg holds degrees from Princeton University, where I know him from, and the University of the Arts in Berlin. Uh, he taught at the ETH for a number of years with Dean Simpson, uh, also from Inter One, uh, during which time he formulated many of his notions on the uh, informal city that he'll be talking about today. And currently, Jorg is a visiting professor at the TU in Berlin. He's also, in addition to other things, the principal of Arkenform and was previously with Instant Architecture. Also, he's the author of numerous publication exhibitions, including his recent work that was included in the Rotterdam Architecture Biennale, which he will be talking about uh, today. And I'd just like to say, first of all, um, it's always a pleasure to introduce a friend here to the AA. And today is a distinct pleasure of introducing a someone else who is marooned in suburban New Jersey. So with that. <laughs> okay, can everybody can hear me? Yeah? <coughs> so thank you, um, Mark, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for getting me here. Also, thank you to Andrew Tam, who was uh, playing a big part in um, preparing me that I should give a lecture at the AA. Um, first time I've been here, I shouldn't say when, but I was pretty young. And I remember just stumbling into the uh, running into the school and by chance uh, as a student seeing a student review. And I was really scared and fascinated how many color copy prints were on the wall. Um, by that time, it was impressive. Um, so now I'm facing the problem that I might have a little bit too many slides, but I'm trying to cut short. As I was uh, told, we should get it done less than an hour and also have some time to talk discussion. Um, that I'll click off. You actually see our page, and I. The Union of Inhabitants and Commerce of Perth. UMCP develops projects to address and I just wanted problems to show you like a education quick view and into urban in uh, the mini doc format the representing UMCP a project of the that was actually developed at the size and facilities uh, as it is a directly servicing and that you might be familiar with of the 80,000 inhabitants um, when oops, it's not functioning so well with the screen revolution, uh, resolution, but you see there is an information sheet and uh, several navigation modes that you could choose in order to access projects and mini dogs. Um, I'm stepping out of that and start the lecture, but it should be the internet as infrastructure, MIC4, bridges the gap between people with needs Just and people with means. For you, um, to get you onto the page, have a look at it, and uh, maybe even think about possible contributions. And I will tell you about uh, the page, how we uh, designed it, how it's uh, uh, intended to grow, and uh, the context, urban inform. Uh, I call the lecture tools and prototypes for the informal city um, because Reiner, Hill, and me from Urban Inform, we designed it to become a tool. In the course of the International Architecture Biennale in Rotterdam, uh, which uh, was the fourth in a row and had the topic of the open city, um, the f fascinating thing about the show was that also the uh, place uh, of uh, the Netherlands Architecture Institute was redesigned in order to become uh, an open place accessible directly into the main lecture hall. Um, and from there, people were able to access or the visitors to access uh, like sub themes, five sub themes plus a theme on uh, Rotterdam itself, community collective refuge, diaspora it was in the beginning and what city squad which was ours. And the main curator, Kees Christians and Tim Rienitz, they decided to approach the open city and new modes and for living a uh, city of coexistence from uh, contemporary urban challenges. As community was uh, kind of talking about uh, gated community phenomena 
in the United States collective was talking about the former UDSSR, huge housing, uh, um, collective housing projects, uh, Refuge was uh, focusing on the Near East, and Diaspora was facing on Jakarta finally. Makeable Society on Rotterdam and Squad, we decided to focus on Brazil and uh, Ethiopia. But we called the show finally Squad, the informal city under construction, and divided it in two parts. The first part we called the construction of knowledge, and this was directly bound to the tool that we developed for this uh, part of the show uh, in order to create an archive of contemporary projects plus a research on the historic background. So this was the first part of our section, the construction of knowledge. And the second part of our section was called this construction of the city, where we actually engaged and uh, um, started two projects in uh, Sao Paulo and in Addis Ababa. And I will also divide the presentation into the first part talking about urban inform and the second part uh, urban inform as an archive and the second part where urban inform started to uh, generate and uh, stimulate projects. Um, well, these are facts uh, most of you know, but it was important for the exhibition to say that uh, one third of the world's urban population, which makes up 50%, uh, of the world population today, one third of this is living in so-called slums, and slums uh, professionally used most of the people uh, draw back to the definition of the human habitat, which is a negative definition, uh, trying to uh, identify um, the elements that are missing in a slum from what one could uh, consider a city which is equipped to house its inhabitants. So tenure security missing, hygiene uh, support missing, uh, education facilities missing, and so forth. Um, as many of our colleagues then say that are working in the same field, the future of the city will be informal. We kind of put a question mark behind it, uh, going with the notion that there is definitely a tendency that uh, most of our um, kind of urban resources in the future will be uh, auto-generated, mostly by the inhabitants in slum-like conditions but that there is still a professional agency to negotiate between formal means of development and of a certain control and the strengthening of these auto-generative processes. And we tried uh, to support this uh, uh, in the exhibition. So informal city, these are just uh, a couple of images that show the ambivalence of the phenomena. Here you see Rio de Janeiro, and you see what most people know as the kind of self-built favela structures, but in it you see developer projects that are you know, officially built with construction companies and uh, that make a, a kind of quite profitable return for the developer within the favela structure. The same in Rio de Janeiro. But when you look at informal cities that develop uh, beyond uh, kind of government administrative control, you can also look at uh, Western cities with a certain uh, history of uh, informal appropriation of urban space, like Berlin in the 1970s, the second period in the 80s, and definitely in the 90s after the war came down. Um, informal cities. You can also talk about huge um, European cities and their edge conditions, which uh, definitely find uh, a very uh, strange phenomena of squatting today, and definitely in the last recent six to seven years. Uh, when you look at Sao Paulo, you see that uh, the informally auto-generated favela is very proximate, very close to a huge development, which one would consider part of the more formal part of the city. But then you also have informal developments like in Mexico City that have managed to really reach a state where they are very well equipped with infrastructure, with traffic infrastructure and connection to the city. And you could say these are uh, 25 to 30 years developments that have reached a standard which is equivalent in a certain mode to a formally um, developed and planned city. So this is the wide spectrum that we were approached with when we were asked to do our section squad. And we said we want to focus um, on constructing an archive of international best practice projects with urban inform and focus then on two test sites of Sao Paulo and Addis Ababa more closely. Uh, thematically, what we wanted to look at were 
was at the producers of the city and really engaging and integrating uh, the inhabitants that construct the city as official producers of the city. We wanted to also look um, at new typologies, urban typologies that are evolving during this uh, construction process, the city under construction as a mix of rural and urban prototypes. Um, we wanted to look not at top-down versus bottom-up, but of, of, uh, at possibilities to combine top-down and bottom-up processes. And because we finally engaged in two actual projects, we also wanted to understand our research and engagement uh, as performative, meaning not to be um, kind of from an ivory tower looking down on the informal city, but being part of the processes that generate it. Um, maybe the only theoretical note that I will make is that we were uh, very much interested in trying to understand or translate uh, actor network theory, uh, which uh, is a theory on science and on mostly sociology um, to what we find uh, happening in the urban when we talk about informality. Bruno Latour, who is one of the many uh, uh, scientists that are engaging in the actor network theory, uh, gives as one of his examples uh, the Leviathan uh, in the way that he was uh, taken uh, by Hobbes to define the absolute monarch, but as an embodiment of uh, the city of the state. And you see how all the bodies of the citizens become part of the body of the monarch. And we were asking what happens if the monarch loses his head and the body starts to exist by itself. And actor network theory uh, is really trying to, to think uh, most of the, the gaining of knowledge, most of uh, the processes that uh, um, produce, you could say, achievements in mankind or uh, major shifts in knowledge assembly by trying to describe or retelling the stories of the multiple networks in which this knowledge is generated. And that within those networks it is the actors, but also the text, the tools, the machines, the material physicality of the living condition that are part of these stories that actor network theory is telling. And you could see very simply like a stupid diagram, but that actors are sometimes more than simple people, but that actors, the technology is part of this kind of acting uh, diagram that uh, actor network theory is retelling. And very simple because uh, uh, example of an actant may be very simplified, but that we always liked uh, that actor network theory is uh, giving is the man pistol. It is uh, the man in the use of a tool, or here you see the woman, which becomes an actant and, and more than he would be as a simple human actor through the tool that he uses. So for us to understand when we talk about the informal city, what are those actors? What are those networks and tools that are used and how can one trace associations? Um, that even in a general way, architects try to understand the city from the view of the informal, everyday or auto-generated city has a history. And I'm just showing one slide here, um, which you might know first uh, above is uh, a critique of uh, the Siam Gris by uh, Le Corbusier, which was a functional grid of uh, trying to understand the formal, you could say, planned city, where uh, the Smithsons uh, started uh, research on the street and developed a grid that started to include the everyday and the actors within the street as one of uh, those who are creating the city. Uh, the second one below is another critique of the same time uh, of the CM functionalist view of the city by the Gamma Group, which started to talk about the bidonville, like the auto-generated uh, settlements, as a functional part of the city itself. So this shift, uh, which we think is contemporary, has quite uh, a history in architectural, uh, in architectural theory and practice. Um, another thing when we talk about actors and networks 
is a quote by Saskia Sassen and her um, latest research that, and I can cut this short, is talking about how what you would formally consider as local networks or local less powerful networks that through the means of technology start to become more empowered and act on a global scale, which she defines as a new kind and specific kind of activism. And uh, one of the pieces that we have in the show is the one computer per child that uh, most of you might know. So what we said is that we could, instead of going through the magazines and publications that are currently fluctuating about projects on the informal city and create a web tool that through an international competition and uh, friends of us in uh, certain communities in Africa and Sao Paulo could be used to even uh, attract projects, hand in of projects that are not published yet, are not within the publication world and thus broaden our field of research. And this uh, tool that I just showed you in the beginning was an um, inform. We had a uh, uh, competition in the beginning that was internationally uh, published. And we got, I think, in about one and a half months last year, we got like about 456 entries of projects from which we finally selected uh, 120 for the show. And you see, like in the show, you have uh, the mini documentaries, and I will talk about that later, about the projects plus printouts of the screens, uh, which were um, formed in certain clouds that were thematically uh, uh, kind of trying to give a reflection on what was presented. Uh, plus, on the other side, on the left side of uh, this kind of walkway, you had uh, manuals that would belong to the project's one-to-one -one installations of the construction methodologies and objects, as well as some historical research where we found uh, that some of the projects are really a conscious or unconscious déjà vu of uh, an earlier history of the engagement in the field. Um, Inform works uh, in a way that um, the archive is accessible from outsider through specific clouds that uh, can be chosen by playlists or platforms and have uh, projects uh, coupled and grouped out of the 120 that, are, that were there in September, a navigating field. Uh, but you also have a mode which uh, is a Google Map link where you can see the location of the projects. Uh, in any kind of mode, uh, you can access the mini docs, play them, enlarge them, and have fact sheets and discussion boards and platforms that uh, members can uh, generate. And member becomes everyone who um, kind of logs in, uh, asks for membership and contributes a project or the start of a project. All the mini docs can be generated online. It's a flash format. Uh, each user can upload like six to 12 images. He can record his voice. Uh, type the subtitles and give all the additional information on the project. Then it's reviewed by us as editors. Uh, we give some kind of feedback of how the mini doc works because it depends if it's you know a young kind of student working in an office giving handing it in, it in or uh, whatever, like a 60-year-old man working for an NGO sitting for the first time at a kind of interactive uh, website. So there's sometimes more and sometimes less tutoring. Now, from the selection of projects that we see in the first part of the show in the Rotterdam Biennale, the construction of knowledge, I think we try to give an understanding of what actors are. And actors are various from uh, social movement actors. This is from Dignity Barricade, uh, a movement that supports the uh, protesters against uh, certain urban um, gentrification projects and also for projects uh, where squatters are evicted from houses uh, that are not, not in use. And it documents uh, their fight, but also, and you will see that later, gives a strategy. But then we have also very complex projects, which, and as you might all know, Teddy Cruz, who very closely thinks or very deeply thinks about uh, actors as part of uh, creating his projects. Um, and then we see and what we discover, which is also linked to actor network theory, but definitely to the projects we have on the side, that an actor 
is what is made to act by many others. So we have especially these uh, support websites where social business constructs are behind uh, architectural and small-scale urban projects. Uh, and we have projects which are uh, in close link to both the urban administration but also to local communities like uh, this uh, temporary project which is now carried on and I think also in collaboration with uh, uh, a team from the AA, uh, Nilsson Garrido, a former boxer, which created this uh, library and uh, gym station as a concept to, to work with uh, urban spaces uh, in the future. And then it's not about simply groups, but group formations, which are changing. And uh, we have a project which was one of our prize winners in the competition, which is the Konkui Initiative in uh, uh, Nairobi, uh, which is in, uh, located in one of the worst slums, but which tries to create a public space which is totally supported by the community and uh, has as much income generation as well as like small architectural interventions that make this public space work. And then definitely objects are participants in the course of action and objects become actants with actors. Very you know, bluntly put, put its uh, machines for construction but also devices uh, for the everyday. This is a water transporting uh, tool uh, that was developed in uh, South Africa and has gone through the press, but also some design objects for water clarification. And this is just in a test phase, but we found it very interesting and got the first kind of prototypes in our exhibition where uh, water is disinfected uh, through these expandable foils in the sun. And then if we talk about materials, machines, and techniques, this is one of the few student projects that we have on the website. It's uh, the idea that uh, quite complex school buildings could be made out of uh, the rest of wood production and uh, generate these shell structures with just uh, nails and uh, um, uh, a negative or form that is uh, used many times to, to create those shells. So what are networks? We are also, first place, uh, even have other internet networks that are well functioning as mini docs on our website. This is Howtopedia, which was developed by people from the ETH, and which is a fan, fan, uh, fascinating, like low tech construction manual, which is online and functioning very, very, uh, very, very well. But then networks are not only these um, digital networks as we understand them, and uh, we want to um, definitely stress with our research and the project that we feature that. Networks are made by relations and relations between people and associations between people rather than by abstract forms of nodes. So these are just uh, samples from uh, a project which is called Cité de Femmes, City of Women, which is an extraordinary uh, project uh, by REFDAF. Uh, it's the resource of women of a sustainable development in Africa and it's in Dakar. Uh, it's about four 200 women uh, that uh, have saved money by themselves through an ongoing process for six years now of small social businesses that have bought land and that will be building and designing their own neighborhood for about 1,000 people with the first houses being constructed uh, now in January and February, uh, collaborating with the University of um, Sheffield. And we had uh, Majigen Chise, who is the organizer and leader of this organization uh, uh, with us on the Rotterdam Biennial, which is a project which works together with the state and not with any kind of uh, other NGO. Um, and then definitely it's the human and non-human actors within those networks, project from uh, Rotterdam, uh, near from Amsterdam, about the regeneration of a neighborhood, a uh, very simple story. Uh, turning kind of devastated uh, in between greens of a modernist housing project into an urban farming, but creating a space where uh, people can meet and cook. And it was an artist initiative running now for two years, which has been uh, like really giving an enormous shift within the neighborhood. And sure, if we talk about materials, uh, we come back to Teddy Cruz and his ideas of uh, recycling, building, uh, and engaging even uh, factory owners in the production of uh, building materials for their workers' homes. 
And then I think we are near the end uh, uh, of examples I wanted to skip through. This is Manavashtana crash uh, in India, in, I think in Bangladesh. It's uh, a project which, um, uh, no, in India, in, um, ah, I, don't, I don't exactly know the town by now, but the guy that's leading this organization is really fascinating because he engages the community in creating the community centers mostly uh, like to 90% out of mis recycled materials and thus provides learning opportunities for all of the people that are in the project for their own individual homes by using the construction techniques. And then one can say an important thing that, that ANT is talking about is that um, you cannot use the scale um, the scale criteria if you talk about networks because they are s kind of short networks and long networks but they act both on the micro and macro scale. Um, represented in our research it is in projects that span a wide field of even bigger urban design projects like uh, the Fess River Regeneration Project which uh, recently won the Holcim Award and engages a lot of experts uh, on this uh, project with the community. But also then um, an understanding that has uh, already reached uh, urban governance. This is uh, an incredible uh, data tool for uh, the Sao Paulo administration to get accessible data about the favelas that they're working with and this uh, tool is also accessible by everyone else. It's a kind of open uh, device. And here you see again uh, a dignity barricade, uh, the one I was showing you in the beginning, uh, where a, social, a group, an activist group in Sao Paulo used the uh, advertising signs of uh, uh, real estate uh, brokers to create uh, barricades, uh, you know, asking for judge justice within the process of uh, evictions of uh, squatted houses. Yeah, and finally, networks and actors sometimes even blend into one another. This is uh, uh, MyC4, um, a social business webpage uh, supporting small enterprises in Africa. Yeah, and how to trace associations? I think uh, we try to tell several stories within the exhibition, but uh, this is our hope for the future that uh, Urban Inform and its collection of projects will not only be a simple archive of individual projects and approaches to specific challenges of the informal city and presenting projects from both urban administration as well as bottom-up uh, initiatives, but that it also will make possible to trace the association of forces and people within the process of building and construction uh, in those fields. Um, I would now go to the second uh, part of the lecture and talk about the construction of the city, the two projects in Addis Ababa and Sao Paulo. But I was thinking if there was any kind of remarks, questions by now which are directed to Urban Inform as a web tool or questions of understanding um, would be open. Yeah? This is what we are doing right now. It was um, thought to go on. This was all of our impact. Yeah. Exactly. Um, no, this is the whole aim behind it. We wanted to generate something which is not just collecting material, but which could become a tool itself after the biennial. And uh, we have uh, uh, an we founded an association that is uh, kind of carrying it out. Where like we are three friends that are mostly conducting it at the moment, but we have a nonprofit status uh, pending now. We have all the applications done. We'll be based in located in Switzerland, and uh, we have contacts to sponsors in order to get it really run over at least over the next two or three years, and then see how it is uh, functional. Uh, we are currently revising also the technical infrastructure uh, behind the website to make it more accessible and uh, uh, create better links. So this is the whole uh, aim behind the game, to really use something that people can make use of. And uh, even to access and get people to the website 
from uh, fields or territories that are kind of badly connected, the whole thing runs in its third mode, which is a list mode, even with a 64K modem. And this is why everything is also in, f in a flash format. So they're not videos, but flash formats that, uh, you know, are interrupting a little bit, but can still run with a very low modem. So the whole objective is to propel it into the future as an archive, but also as a support institution for projects that brings back brings together urban administration, architects, and local communities, which we tried to do now in the second phase. Yeah. Okay, so, Koteba Hana Mariam, Addis Ababa. Um, uh, Addis Ababa, capital of Ethiopia, is interesting for us because it is a city that was even started, developed as an informal city. It was a settlement of uh, the monarch or the empress, her husband, and several uh, kind of warlords. Uh, and from this kind of little village structure, the whole city developed more or less auto-generated. And over the last hundred years of its existence, there were many kind of impacts, both by the Italians, by uh, British planners, to give it more of a structure, but it stays uh, uh, as an auto-generated capital of supposedly 4 million, official census says 2.7, but supposedly more than 4 million people until today. It has a growth rate of over 5%, which really challenges uh, uh, the city management. And they came up with one of the biggest social housing projects uh, in Africa by today, the Grand Housing Project, uh, you know, generating uh, these um, kind of settlements all over the city at the city edges, in the city center, uh, aiming at creating 200,000 units within five years, um, but uh, not really getting there. Though this effort is uh, fascinating because it's maybe one of the um, you know, biggest logistics that the government had ever to cope with. Still, uh, we would say the Grand Housing Project also has its drawbacks. Uh, we currently don't have alternatives to propose, but for specific uh, moments and areas within the city and at the city border and edges, which have to be controlled, we wanted to start a research with the community and local architects for an alternative development mode at the edges, which is at Koteba Hanamariam. Koteba Hanamariam has its name after the church of Hanamariam, and you can already see how development happens in Ethiopia. What you see in the front is not an idyllic lake, but it's actually the quarry where the stones were taken out to build the church uh, behind, which gives the name to the neighborhood. From the church upwards into the woods and forests and hill lands develops this uh, self-built neighborhoods, which is, uh, has started around 20 years from now. You see the typical um, see Ethiopian typology of uh, the fence surrounding the individual plots, some houses uh, at the street and little shops at the street. Most of the kind of houses that are inhabited are set back uh, on the bigger uh, lots behind the fences. Uh, and there you see um, the kind of most northern part of Koteba Hanamariam and still cluster settlements of the farmers to whom the land belongs. Um, the farmers sell their land to um, settlers officially, but then the settlers change the land use and start to build. This is what makes it informal and also a challenge to uh, the Ethiopian government because the city starts to uh, grow into, into the forest uncontrollably. Um, now they say it's 5,000 people, but one can say this li little kind of settlement has about 10,000 uh, inhabitants. Why we thought it could be interesting to go there was uh, the simple sketch of a friend of mine uh, he's an architect in Addis Ababa. His aunt is one of the first settlers in Koteba Hana Mariam. She got water and electricity and was asked to pay taxes on her land. So she felt secure enough to start building. And paying taxes is a kind of half, a little step towards a possible legalization. So she approached him and said, uh, I want to have a house that you design. They sat back together, had coffee, and he made this sketch on a napkin. Um, and they made an appointment to meet back in two weeks' time. Uh, when they met in, in three weeks after, and he had the plans finalized for her to build 
uh, the house was already finished. And she told him that with her neighbors and friends she had done it and by now uh, like four similar houses have been built by her cousins and uh, friends within the neighborhood. So we thought uh, maybe it's not the place for top-down planning but possibly something where architects could engage and become active and uh, maybe also with very little work involved. That's what we were wrong. Uh, we started uh, the project with um, three students from the university and two local architects. Um, and uh, one student was in mostly in charge, it was uh, Tobias Kurz, whom we went, uh, whom we took there, and he created this first handbook of Koteba Hannah Mariam, drawing the first official plans uh, for us, uh, starting to have interviews with the farmers, understanding their typologies, but also interviews about the history of the place. Um, and then with the settlers and understanding their lots, the way they use them, the things they expect from the future, and then creating very simple maps with uh, structural overviews, uh, electrici electricity formal and informal electricity distribution, fences and gates, and these are all then linked to drawings and images of the handbook, um, compound structures, water resources, uh, and this was, this kind of extensive handbook was a preparation for us to then start uh, with a group of local architects, uh, Sarah Abdul Hafiz, um, Tibe Budesta Daniel and Bizrat Kifle, uh, a project studio which we then took uh, the students and them to Addis Ababa to have workshops at the university discussing possible urban and architectural and open space prototypes but then most interesting, having two weeks to engage with the community and discuss with them what they think, how their city should develop and how they would understand their informal settlement as a neighborhood and possibly as a community, which we found was the biggest question. So we had even very simple like workshops with kids, but then also very active political discussions on what people demanded and what people were afraid for and where we realized that maybe before starting to build uh, the idea of community building within this neighborhood would be es essential. And uh, the most inspiring moments were when these little, uh, with many kind of little workshop suitcases, uh, we approached the community that sometimes we were approached and people asked us to do something with them. And this was a workshop uh, where one mother asked us that uh, we should uh, help her design a common lot with seven of her friends, so we called it the Eight Women Workshop. And uh, they got very simple tools to think about houses, workshops, the compound, the distribution. And after a three hour session, uh, we were absolutely fascinated that uh, leaving them mostly to themselves, they decided not to be on individual lots, but to create a common lot together, to have a fence outside, as you see the red rib ribbons, but to even uh, draw the fence into the property and give parts of their property to the outside, to the community, both as a playground, as a little sanitation st uh, station, but also as a common space of meeting and gathering. And um, this kind of small association of the woman we found fascinating because we were told in our years before when, when we acted in Addis that this was rarely possible that people would get together to do something. Then secondly, they were willing to uh, build uh, up to find a construction technology to have a three-story house that they would live together with, which is also uncommon in Ethiopia, to provide more ground for their working facili facilities and, uh, and gardening. Um, and this was only one example of the very positive experience that we made with the community, but because we also had our local architects with us um, that communicated. Then we had the uh, pleasure because this activity was, uh, was supported by the Addis Ababa Housing Department, which is the highest office also responsible for the grand housing projects, but we wanted to present to the local Kabbalah neighborhood administration, uh, which was a big political game, and I um, experienced afterwards that most of the stuff that I said was totally changed by the translator in order to make it digestible to, uh, uh, to the little uh, neighborhood king. Um, but even, he's, uh, like even in this meeting, we were told as far as we did not work against the government but would uh, provide uh, the information, um, he was for it, which was a, a positive effect. So at the moment, 
and what we showed in, uh, in, in the show at the IIBR, first sketches of a possible community development from a larger scale, um, where you see the red dot houses that we definitely said we have to uh, you know, evict houses and uh, densify the community also to prevent it from sprawling into the forest. But uh, the groups that we discussed with were totally willing at the moment that they were uh, kind of given another property within the, in within the settlement. And on the right side, a rough sketch on the common facilities that would have to be provided for. And the only image I show you now is a before and after, like a possible development of the community in 10 years as far as the proposals that uh, they gave us uh, would be realized by them. And these are very small and simple prototypes for a common uh, infrastructure facility uh, for a way that even a common architecture, uh, agricultural project uh, could start to generate uh, production facilities, but also then a public uh, square and meeting place for the neighborhood that is attached to it. And I think the the image that uh, is now in kind of uh, uh, kind of bird's eye view, but also has a lot of details that the community liked a lot, was this, uh, you know, kind of little image of their possible future town and the places that they could have marriages at and where they could meet and gather and where the schools would be located. This is uh, a little bit of a, you know, utopian uh, future scenario. Um, and how it would should happen, like beyond the images, is definitely a new deal which is now the third phase of the project where two local architects work on the negotiation strategy of the New Deal, which says what the inhabitants would have to contribute and how the uh, local administration have to loosen their administ um, administrative tools, but to stay with a couple of very strict rules and regulations that would uh, kind of control this uh, community building process. And this would be then finally the thing that in half a year we would give forwards to the uh, Kote Bahana Mariam and to the AA HUDP. That was one project which was very bottom up and also um, um, supported by a friend of mine who is uh, uh, very knowledgeable in community design, uh, Matthias Haydn. Uh, it was, bluntly speaking, my first approach to do so intense local workshops and engage so closely with the local community. Uh, it's a very uh, political um, topic that we are raising, uh, but there is a little bit of hope to, uh, to get somewhere, at least the guidelines that we're currently working on to have an effect on the further understanding of uh, these areas within the um, city of Addis Ababa. The second project, uh, Paresopolis Sao Paulo, which Rainer Hale, my uh, office partner, was more in charge of, is totally from the different perspective. You could say it's a top-down project within the favela. It engages in favela Paraisopolis, which is uh, uh, one, you could say, the safest favela within Sao Paulo. It has about 60,000 uh, inhabitants. Um, most of you in the architecture field might know it from this uh, photograph where the clash between you know, high-end uh, luxury living and Favela Parasopolis is shown. What we wanted to do, even though we had, were initiating a top-down project, was to shift the perspective uh, from the view of the inhabitants, which we were only able to because the um, Sao Paulo, the SEAB, the uh, Sao Paulo Social Housing Agency, is engaging very closely in Parasopolis. They have about 2,000 um, workshops participatory workshops with the community each year where they meet uh, the representatives, where they discuss projects and interventions. The basis so for an urban regeneration project or is fantastic, but then what is uh, proposed um, are these kind of social housing projects replacing the favela. And maybe because, um, only because my partner Rainer is much less diplomatic than me, um, when he was shown these images, he said uh, to the head of the office, uh, it's a fantastic participation process and organization, but the architecture really sucks and does not perform. What I maybe would ha have hardly said on the first meeting, she told him, okay, propose an alternative and invite some architects, uh, local and international, to uh, maybe think differently about it. So this is um, a Parasopolis from a bird's eye view, and these are 
uh, the areas that uh, architects were working on, Gotinho, Gotao, uh, Antonico, and uh, Jardim Colombo. Um, some of the sites were shifted during the process because what we also did was uh, presenting, like in two stages of the project development, these projects to the community, discussing, but then also land use difficulties that made us shift. In the exhibition, finally, we had uh, a huge model uh, provided by uh, the Sao Paulo administration and uh, the local interventions of the project. And I think I will only show three of those now briefly. Um, the first one is by um, Alejandro Aravena and Elemental in Chile, uh, which I show because you all know his incremental building uh, principle, but what they tried uh, for a site within the edges of uh, favela um, Paraisopolis, uh, we found like really challenging because for the first time in their research and building activity, they try this principle to extend to seven floors, combined given infrastructure, structural and minimal living spaces that then can be expanded within the structure by the inhabitants. This was the visualization for the Biennale. And currently, uh, the municipality is checking if uh, the building laws in Brazil allow for auto construction and self-building uh, over the second and third floor. Um, but this is... Uh, this is a project where, which we thought was really challenging, the ideas of densification and social housing within the favela. Uh, then a local team of MMBB architects together with Christian Wertmann from uh, GSD Harvard, Dirty Works. Only a few slides, but this is a project which is not so building-based, but regenerates um, a river, um, a river which is now a small, tiny riverbed which takes us all the debris of... Uh, uh, the fluid liquids uh, in the uh, neighborhood. It's more or less a waste river. And their project says within uh, Paraisopolis, if you want to keep the existing structure, you have to provide a division of uh, rainwater, flow water, natural water, and uh, the use water or wastewater. And just along this canal, also creating water facilities and then thinking very simply how the inhabitants could be housed around these sites that have to be opened because they are currently also building on the river in order to get, create a public space and the dense housing next to it. This is more a scheme on the architectural level, but uh, very much a, a clever proposal on the infrastructural level of the whole city. And the third project that I'll show is uh, by Christian Keres, who is a Swiss architect. And I think everyone was um, really uh, astonished that we proposed him to work on a project in Sao Paulo. Um, and it was really an incident because we knew that he had links uh, to Brazil because his family is standing from there. But what Christian Keres is renowned for is uh, high-end, few projects, um, very precise, you could say, one of the most intelligent uh, Swiss architects at the moment, but who is engaging with all of his projects to make a major statement also in the kind of highbrow world of architecture. Um, now, his uh, meeting with the local community was maybe the most fascinating because if before he even started to speak, uh, the community representative got up and said that they have no need of a Swiss architect in uh, Sao Paulo. And Christian Keres, in his uh, ways, uh, started to just show photographs that he took in uh, the favela uh, of spaces that he really likes and is uh, infatuated with. Um, then he had a very simple um, reflection as an architect from overseas thinking about and comparing densities and then coming up with a proposal to say okay if the density is 1.7 mostly and it goes up to three to four levels within the self-built structure why not try in the future to make it even denser and go to 2.5 
And he came up with uh, very simple collages that he presented to the community where he said the only thing that he wants to do is hook them up with engineers and give them construction technologies that would extend the city that they already built in a better and secure way. And the beautiful thing after his presentation was that they all loved him because he was the first one that accepted their improvised aesthetics of self-building as something which he said, this is the image and this is the atmosphere and this is uh, the image, the face of Paraisopolis and not any other project. And what he's working on now, I think uh, uh, the Sehab was a little bit scared to let him directly intervene in, so they gave him a site outside where he should test his uh, uh, density proposal and his uh, spatial concept for these houses. And he made a quite meticulous uh, study on density and on generic spaces that would allow to be used and perform absolutely the way that the spaces perform that the people have constructed today. So no social housing, but houses that integrate shops, workshops, uh, housing, apartments, and can be subdivided the way that people want. Because on our trip, we even found interior gardens within those favela houses. We found garages and everything. And he was totally fascinated by this generic idea of the structure. And uh, you see his project here. Two days before the opening of the biennial, which was September something last year, um, the government of Brazil spoke 200 million uh, for those project studies in order to be realized. Um, we are working on it and the individual teams are working on it too. Sometimes processes take longer and are slower, but uh, last fall we were extremely happy about this uh, uh, official notion and I think it was the first time that the CEHAP, the urban administration uh, office got very positive press, like even from the left side, the way that they deal with uh, Parisopolis and the question of the favelas. Um, we also used the opening of the Biennale to bring together the two most important women at this time. In Addis Ababa and Sao Paulo, you see on the upper uh, right-hand side is Sedale Mamo. She's the head of the social housing department in charge of the grant housing project and also a little uh, study in Addis Ababa. And you see uh, on the big image in the center, uh, Elisabeth Franza, who is uh, coordinating the whole uh, Paraisopolis uh, project. And uh, uh, we had guests from uh, UN Habitat, which is the head of UN Habitat, uh, uh, Acholi and uh, Gilson, who is uh, the kind of head of the community of uh, Paraisopolis uh, in an engaged discussion. This is what Urban Inform is managing at the moment. Next to these projects, we will be presented, uh, we have uh, planned a network event at the World Urban Forum organized by UNH in uh, Rio in March where we chose uh, projects from Urban Inform and local administration, politicians and architects to discuss. Uh, and we have two shows that we're currently preparing, but that are also related to local issues. One is in Istanbul, and the other one will be the re-edition of the projects for Sao Paulo, in Sao Paulo, in the museum in Sao Paulo by the SEAP. So what Urban Inform needs is more or less uh, you. So check it out, and thank you. I think I made it in an hour. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Work again, yeah. So uh, I think we have time for well, uh, some questions. So if anyone has some questions, you can set up. Yes. Hi, um, with talking about the project in Addis, yes. um, it, see, it appears to be at, at still at quite a large scale urban level at the yeah. moment just from what you showed, but I was intrigued by your mention of the importance of technology in kind of 
advancing um, communities like those in Ethiopia. And I wondered how much you've gone into that and what kind of research you're em embarking on in that direction. Mm -hmm. Well, when we, when we were there, I think we realized that mostly it's, it's very, very low tech and the stuff that you need is quite simple. And when, when we talk about technology, there's one is thing is building technology. Um, and uh, there are also training uh, opportunities even within the grant housing proge program to go kind of on a higher level of construction technology. But you very quickly leave the realm of the auto-generated, of the self-built, and uh, have to kind of collaborate with NGOs, which are not very supported at the moment in Ethiopia, or to collaborate with developers. This is what some uh, smaller groups are doing, that they build cooperatives in order to go together with developers to get on higher kind of building technique standards. Um, when it comes to, to, to other kind of technologies, we found that uh, the simple provision of water and infrastructure and the kind of clearance of infrastructure like clear water and division of wastewater um, it was the strongest argument for this specific community. And uh, many of the projects that the students did would involve barriers like bamboo techniques, like alternative techniques for auto construction. Uh, and those really depend on the economic possibility of people to afford it and to even afford the transport of this material. Um, so we are totally in negotiation with this thing. Like we were really thinking very par parallelly in the small prototypes that we're giving to be able to be done with the traditionally not so good materials and sometimes thinking about um, reinforcing certain parts of, for example, the houses to be expandable, like in the second and third store. And for that we have, uh, even, but I would not, yeah, I would call this technology, but not high tech, like even working with uh, walls, I don't know how you call it in English, where you use like found stones, which are abundant on the site to start a very simple like construction core, which then could be expanded with uh, kind of more simpler like eucalyptus tree available materials. But this is a low tech level, yeah. Um, I also wondered, is there a kind of a time scale on the projects you're you're working on in Addis at the moment? Is it an kind of ongoing thing for Well, how many we, are, we are under a little bit of pressure because um, uh, the local architect that we are working with, it's mostly one of them, Sarah, who's in charge of doing the handbook, like the third edition of the handbook with uh, the kind of negotiation strategy. Um, and she, she will only be with us another like three, four months. So that's our pressure. Whereas with the local community, we really said we cannot hardly give you anything in terms of like finances. Like the only thing that we could give you back is this information and then we can try to negotiate parallelly with you and the kind of high officials within the building department and uh, kind of uh, urban administration. But where we get there, I still have, I just still don't know. You know, because we're not big players and we consciously tried not to be because there's a big movement against NGOs and also external uh, interference in Addis Ababa at the moment. So we tried as much that whatever we produce to give it back to people there and make the contacts. And I would say we want to have this project phase finished in three to four months and then see what comes from the other side. We neither have the means, finances or power to start something uh, ourselves, but, yeah. Thanks. Questions? Yeah. Um, I think, to follow up on that, there's a strange sort of transit in uh, what you're discussing, in your role, and when it goes from the informal to the formal, which seems to be the point where, um, something that is uh, auto-generative, as you describe it, uh, passes over into something that has regulations yeah. which govern the way in which it's produced. Uh, so obviously in um, Addis Baba, it's this um, 
uh, moment where the uh, ways in which the construction technologies occur, or construction practices rather, um, pass over the three story limit and become four, five, six, whatever. And then there needs to be a type, well there doesn't need to be, but there becomes a type of building legislation associated with health and safety and everything. And in the terms of the way in which you have discussed it, do you see uh, your role, or the role of an architect, say, as being a kind of a facilitator of that transit? What I mean is, in terms of your uh, uh, story of your, your friend who was designing the house, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a nice kind of parable of architecture without architects within that, mm -hmm. and, that and the time it takes them to design the house is already being fulfilled. Yeah. So I'm just wondering kind of what... I, uh, well, we thought, we approached even this um, interaction, like we al always had this like uh, small and simple and even architecturally not so engaging prototypes that we talked about construction-wise. What I thought was more interesting when it comes to rules is the neighborhood and the spatial layout of the neighborhood, which is similar. Yeah. Uh, I, I think also relates to your question. And um, you, could, you could see that we could come up with very, like we have a set of four rules which relate to land donation, relocation, uh, facilities for the public that each landowner has to provide in order to become legalized on his piece of land. And the rules for the community should help and finally the neighborhood to self-govern itself. So it also has an auto-constructive mode in it. So we said if you are carrying on just, you know, selling land, building houses, then you will all be gone or bulldozed because they were already in 2007, the upper part. Some of them came back, but they're just waiting for the next bulldozers to come. And uh, we said the proactive role would be that you define yourself certain rules and where you allow people to, to live and not to live so that the community starts to take control over this land and says we are able to exactly do that. And it's in our interest that new incoming settlers have to restrict their activity to a certain ground. And when you talk about that, uh, you find like how many rules are made by the Ethiopian governments. They have a lot of rules. It's, it's the question like how they can implement them, but we had this, but there are, there's huge guidelines and rules and they even start to forbid to build in Adobe because they find it insecure and suddenly people were not officially allowed to build in Adobe. Now they're trying to bring it back, but they're constantly issuing new rules. But what we were discussing was exactly this topic with the head of the housing uh, agency of Addis Ababa and local Ethiopian architects. Maybe the informal city needs much less rules, but those rules have to really perform in the situation, like I'd say in the urban situation specifically to that land. And this is where we thought we could have uh, a role as you know, even urban designers coming from the outside, or architects coming from the outside to maybe reevaluate what is really important to be set as a standard or as a restriction or as a kind of a, a kind of kind of glass ce uh, ceiling. Oops, it's myself. Could we cut that out of the? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just see. I just it's that again. It's that yeah. thing yeah. where like um, it seems to me that if if say the manual works to simplify the legislation down to certain governable rules, yeah. then already in that process of legislation, and sort of yes. gauge, which is still a type yeah. of legislation, yeah. there's uh, a kind of uh, formalism to that. Yes. So in a way there's a kind of, yes. you know, it's already the formal city. Yes. So you're... No, but, uh, yeah, no, but this is what I was tried yeah. to say in the beginning, you know, I'm, uh, I think our engagement grew within mm -hmm. like informal and auto-generative structures, um, but and I was discussing this, for example, a lot with the guys from Urban Think Tank mm -hmm. who are also in our Sao Paulo project, but they were there earlier, like they, they were already had a step, uh, like a foot into the Parasopolis thing. And when we discuss with them, they sometimes say, no, the you know, auto-generative, the informal, that's the future, you know, that's where we all have to go. And I think Rana and me, we, we are a little bit critical about this attitude. And, uh, you know, and I come from, from, from field of architects and friends from Berlin, squatted houses, you know, in the 90s, and they're really kind of totally into this kind of self-organization, self-building, auto-generative. Um, um, but Ren and me, we thought there has, like, most of the informal 
settlements have in a certain way to go and establish certain formalisms and you know and certain rules that are productive for the neighborhood because also they have um, they have demands from the Sao Paulo they have demands to the urban government you know they are angry because they don't have like a water facility because things are dirty there, there there is a certain demand to urban governance to organize things and do things better and even people in Addis Ababa they're angry about the situation and and I think there th this is where the two positions have to meet I, I, I guess yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I see what you're saying I guess it's that moment where you pay tax you require services so you already bought into that kind of model and then yeah, yeah. well give a, uh, any other questions I was gonna say one thing but th that oh yeah there's one brief thing is there's a weird thing there's a crossover it seems to me between paying tax which is to enter one kind of system and to uh, use the internet which is to use another type of system so with your uh, web um, uh -huh. uh, application application uh, tool, yeah. tool you've set up um, I'm just wondering what, what I mean in terms of the number of people who aren't connected to the internet within the communities in which you want to sponsor this right. type of connectedness? Yeah. I mean, what kind of facility there is there? The, the good thing is I think you will never have the total connectedness yeah. of all of us. And uh, um, uh, the people, how they deal it there, like we had uh, contributions to Urban Inform. One of them was uh, the electric chair, but by a guy who was really fighting for his project from Egypt. And he doesn't have a computer at home. You know, and, and he called me from his mobile, like on a daily basis, if he was, you know, in the competition still, and and, and and he would go to an internet cafe and upload his stuff, and see, and he saw it even in an internet cafe, where I think there are communities that are not connected to the internet at all, and there are communities that are very badly connected, but I think the people that we want to reach, we have a chance to connect them, and what the ideal would be, that finally, this tool would have in certain regions in the world like representatives that are really with their feet on the ground in certain neighborhoods and that would use it just on the side and you know bring people together to make a presentation within an internet cafe or an office or something but we don't have this infrastructure but I think there's there's not the aim no. that we think we will all finally be connected and have access no, uh, I just uh, think it's that weird thing where that's a limit it's a limit you know, not yes. a, not a of not sponsoring yeah. connectivity it's yeah. just that's odd kind of conceptual limit yeah. for instance like you can't like the Amish which is a highly planned community no <laughs> no. <laughs> no no that's a tough point yeah all right uh, okay well uh, thank you York, for your wonderful presentation thank it's you very pleasure. much for your kind and, uh, uh, yeah. attention thank you